So we're beginning a six-week series on biblical literacy, which is pretty much an unusual topic. Probably very few people have had a series on this topic. It's not written on much or talked about much. The inspiration for it was a, a small book that was put out earlier this year. I think it came out just probably about a month ago. It's called A Primer on Biblical Literacy. It's by Dr. Corey Marsh, a New Testament professor from Southern California Seminary, uh, and read this book, and I thought it was great and wanted to put our own series out based on the material that's in this book. Uh, the material from this book is going to be the basis for the first two classes of the series, and then after that it's going to be the next four weeks of stuff that I'm putting on following that. So if you're like, man, the quality really dropped off after the first two weeks, well, you know that's me. Or on the other hand, if it got really great after the first two weeks, you can let me know that as well. All right, so I want to just give us a little overview of where we're going in this topic. So tonight in our opening night, we're going to talk about why and what. So why are we having a series on biblical literacy and what it's all about? Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at Herman Wudicks, uh, the subject of hermeneutics, uh, biblical interpretation. Uh, three is going to be where all good stories begin. And that is the importance of reading the Bible from the beginning of each section that you read it. And then week four is poems, stories, and letters, oh my, on the different genres that you're going to encounter in the Bible and how you should respond to each one in a slightly different way. Uh, week five is on Gentiles, Jews, and Christians. And that's the importance of understanding the audience of each portion of the Bible that you're reading. And then week six is called Spices and Sprinkles, and that is on taking any little bits of information that we can get on the biblical world and then applying that to our understanding of Scripture. So anytime we can learn little parts of information like facts about geography or culture or things that we come to us from archaeology and about uh, where to find that information and how to use it in good ways or uh, in not so good ways. And so we'll talk about that in week six. So this is six weeks on biblical literacy, and those are going to be the topics that we're covering. So we're going to start with, with why we're doing a series on biblical literacy. And it starts with understanding what these four seemingly unrelated things have in common, and that is the perpetual virginity of Mary, the rise and spread of Islam, the founding of Mormonism, and then the tragic events with Jim Jones's cult of the People's Temple in South America. Uh, what all of these have in common is that they are all based on a twisting of scripture that could have been prevented if people understood the subject of biblical literacy. And that is they could read the Bible with understanding. Um, all cults, all deviant teaching outside of the scripture preys off of individuals who are either unable or unwilling to read the Bible on their own. So starting off with the perpetual virginity of Mary, this is the belief that Mary uh, was a virgin from when she was born until when she died. And the interesting thing about this teaching is that when it was first introduced in the church, it was instantly condemned as a heresy because uh, it was found in the uh, Gospel of James. The Gospel of James is a Gnostic gospel. It's got some ridiculous and crazy stuff in it. I mean, it's just off the wall. And everybody was like, yeah, this stuff is not true. And so, uh, but that's where the perpetual virginity of Mary came from that gospel. It's teaching the idea that the physical world is sin. And so just having a body, having sexual relations, uh, all of that stuff is sin no matter what. And so one of the interesting things in that story is when it recounts the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus is instantly transported from Mary's womb into the arms of the midwife who 
who is there to deliver her. And it was seen as, as a heresy early on because people were closer to their Bible. And then after several hundred years, all of a sudden, when people were more and more separated from the Scripture, it came back and all of a sudden then became a teaching in church history that was widely accepted. So that was one that was initially re- rejected and then became a part of the church. Uh, second is Islam. Uh, Islam is mostly known today as one of the three great, and by I say great, I mean a large number of adherents, uh, one of the three great monotheistic religions in the world. Uh, but the more interesting thing about it is that for hundreds of years after Islam was created, Islam was not known as a separate religion, but Islam was actually known as a cult of Christianity. And why that was is that Islam is based off of a poor understanding and misreading of the Bible. Uh, There's a shockingly large amount of scripture that is found in the Quran. Uh, Muhammad spread the faulty teaching that all those who would oppose him would be uh, judged in a earth worldwide destruction because Muhammad believed that he was the next Noah to come. And so there were a lot of Noahic and flood accounts in the Quran. Uh, But uh, Muhammad prayed off of a group of people who never knew the Bible, had never read the Bible, never been preached with the Bible, and then brought them uh, twisted versions of scripture. Uh, Third is Mormonism. Uh, The Church of Latter-day Saints actually was started in upstate New York, uh, not far from where my first pastor was located at. It's only a few miles from where Joseph Smith had his his initial visions. He claimed to have visions from uh, two spiritual beings who were God the Father and Jesus And in these visions, they told Joseph Smith about how God uh, was at one time a man who had a literal son through a physical interaction with a woman, and that that, uh, one of the reasons that Adam sinned, uh, or I shouldn't say sinned from the Mormonism perspective, one of the reasons that Adam ate the fruit from the tree was so that he would become mortal. And that is because if you want to end up ascending to being the status of God and Christ, you needed to become mortal first. And so those are some of the false teachings in Mormonism. And Joseph Smith was preying upon people uh, who were related to the church, part of the church, but not involved in a personal reading of the Bible themselves. And then finally, we have Jim Jones. Uh, Jim Jones led a Pentecostal church of 900 people. Uh, Jones claimed to be the voice of God in the flesh. He also claimed to be the person of Elijah returned to earth. And one of the major things that Jones was teaching is that since he was the word of God in bodily form, Nobody else is allowed to read the pages of the Word of God. So he prohibited the reading of Scripture, uh, banned the use of the Bible in the midst of the people's temple, and then following his leading, his church ended up uh, drinking a mixture of cyanide and flavor aid, uh, bringing about the tragedy of what, as we know of, is the largest mass suicide in world history when over 900 people, actually over 300 children, uh, were killed in that mass death. And one of the interesting things is that while Jim Jones prohibited the Bible from being located on the grounds of the People Temple when they went and did their investigations, they actually found several Bibles that people had hidden in the midst of their stuff. Um, but the thing that was obvious was that the Bibles were in the condition where they would be as if you received them brand new and no one had received, no one had read them before. So there were people who had the Bible there. They just didn't open it and read it to discover the false teaching that they were being subjected to. So if we put together all four of these heresies throughout church history, what they were all brought together uh, was an idea of people who couldn't read or understand the Bible. Oh, and then the one other interesting note is that uh, hanging above Jim Jones's throne is a sign uh, that read, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And one thing that we see from the past in church history is that Satan loves to prey on Christians who do not know, understand, or read their Bibles. Uh, There have been an unknown number of Christian cults from Gnosticism 
to today's postmodern progressive church that holds to a divine black female deity, an attempt to uh, get people to be trapped by white guilt, and thousands upon thousands of those cults all base their teaching on people who don't read and study the Bible. Uh, Just thinking about that reminded me of, uh, I don't remember, if you guys remember a couple of months ago, I talked as an illustration about one of the smaller cults in in Britain uh, from about 100 years ago, the Muggletonians, uh, who the Muggletonians based an entire church around the view that the earth was the center of the universe. And uh, they believe that their leaders were uh, Elijah and Enoch come back to life. And the thing that I thought was most funny about the Muggletonians, uh, well, one was their name. I mean, they're the Muggletonians. How is that not hilarious in and of itself? Uh, but second is that they thought that the greatest threat to the church alive in their day was Isaac Newton. And so uh, I just think it's, uh, you know, one of those more funny notes. But there's been hundreds, thousands of these cults. They are a constant threat to the church. And the people don't even realize they're in a cult because they are not reading their Bible with understanding. And it is actually the scripture itself that reveals us to the importance of being people who not just know our Bible, but are able to read the Bible with skill in order to guard and protect our soul. And the passage, I think, that best illustrates the importance of wise biblical reading is Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Remember in Matthew chapter 4, this is right after Jesus is baptized. He is sent into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to fast and pray for 40 days before the start of his public ministry. And who confronts Jesus at the end of that 40-day period in an attempt to stop Jesus' work before it even starts? Uh, None other than Satan. And Satan begins with a simple but, I got to say, soul-crushing temptation. Like, I could not imagine 40 days of fasting and then having Satan come up and be like, hey, why don't you just turn those stones into bread? You know, you are God's son after all. You can turn those stones into bread. And I mean, honestly, who would know? We're in the wilderness all by ourselves. Just turn the stones into bread. And uh, Jesus knows that this one act would be disobedience to the Spirit, uh, would have put immediate uh, stop on his record as the spotless Lamb of God. And so how does Jesus resist Satan's temptation? Well, he quotes scripture, Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, I've always thought that this passage was overall teaching the importance of scripture memory. And that is Jesus had a verse memorized. He could quote it right back to the Satan and how powerful it is in our own lives when we memorize scripture, when we have those verses that we can, we can quote back to the devil about uh, blessings we can have for being poor in spirit in situations where our pride is becoming too much or that we have the power to flee from any temptation and that God gives us that strength. Uh, so many wonderful scriptures to have hidden in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, but I think actually scripture memorization is probably a little bit too simple of a view for what Jesus does in that passage. I say that because after Jesus gets this initial victory where he quotes scripture at Satan, Satan comes back in verse 6 and says this, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So Jesus quotes scripture, and what does Satan do? He comes back and says, you can quote scripture, I can quote scripture too. And one of the things I like about it that I think is kind of funny, just thinking of probably Satan's mindset, is that you'll notice it's in all caps in the part that is uh, a quotation of the Old Testament there, uh, but you have that little and um, sort of about uh, halfway through between you and on, which is showing us that Satan quoted two verses. It's as if Satan was like, Jesus, you could quote one verse. Well, (laughs) I can quote two. And then brings two out to him in order to tempt him. But the thing is, Satan takes these scriptures out of context. He's making them say what they were not intended to say. And Jesus knows that this is not correct biblical understanding. So Jesus responds with his own scripture, which is, On the other hand, is it written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then 
Satan actually abandons the scripture quotation for the third temptation. When Satan says, bow down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't quote scripture again. Because he can see that Jesus knows how to handle Scripture, and so Satan is not going to win from that avenue. He's going to need to go from another perspective. So I believe what Matthew chapter 4 is actually teaching us is that, yes, it's good to have Scripture memorized. Yes, it's good to know those sort of key passages that you can quote back in times of temptation or trial or sharing the gospel, but just knowing and having Scripture memorized is not enough. We need to understand the Bible that we're reading. Because my opinion is that if anybody probably has all of the Bible memorized, every verse, every word, every letter, I'm going to guess it's probably Satan. He's had a lot of time to memorize all the Bible. He's probably spent a lot of time poring over the pages and trying to discern how to overcome what is predicted in the Bible. And so it should be no surprise that since Christ's resurrection, we've seen that the most common way that Satan seeks to lead astray God's people is through a misinterpretation and misuse of the Bible itself. I think one of the interesting things when you look at human history, what do you see in a dramatic decrease after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What you see a dramatic decrease in is having all of these religions around the world that have nothing to do with God's plan. Initially, before Christ was born and rose from the dead, every nation had their own religion, their own way of approaching their gods, imaginary, whatever they could be. But once Jesus comes dies on the cross for our sins, rises from the dead, and then we're given the completed 66 books of the Bible, what do we see about all of the religions that come after that point? They are almost exclusively twisting what we have given to us in the Bible. They are cults based upon Christianity. The idea of having religions totally uh, separated from Christ almost no longer exists before. In J. Werner Wallace's book, The Person of Interest, he uses that as one of the most compelling evidences for the truth of Jesus' existence and impact he has on the world is that the uh, dramatic change in religion that you have after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That before him, it was was a scattered mass of religions that had almost nothing in common. After Jesus rises from the dead, almost every religion in some way tries to connect themselves to Jesus to the point where even the religions that are older than Christianity even change their teachings to all of a sudden include Christ in their religion, which shows us that Satan knows that the best way to deceive people, since he can't go toe-to-toe with Jesus, is that he's got to take Jesus' teaching And he's got to take the word of God and he's got to manipulate it in order to turn the masses away from Christ. This means that for us, the greatest battleground is in the Bible itself. It's separating what is coming out from the Bible as truth in comparison to what is coming out from the Bible in error. If all Jesus could do was quote back to Satan a pile of verses, he wouldn't be able to have responded back to Satan who simply quoted scripture back to him. But since Jesus was biblically literate, uh, the subject that we're looking at here, Jesus was able to respond to Satan's quotations in an accurate way that would reveal the understanding and truth that comes from God's word. And my guess is is that probably if you're showing up for a Wednesday night series on uh, knowing and understanding the Bible, you probably feel pretty secure in your knowledge of the Bible. You've had series on God's Word and how to interpret it before. Uh, But one of the things that we need to also recognize is that while we may feel secure in our knowledge of God's Word, we should never come to a place of pride where we feel like we've made it, we feel like we have arrived. I think that might be the most dangerous place to be, Uh, but we should always be growing in our ability to understand and read the Bible. I think we're setting ourselves up as easy prey to be uh, devoured by the devil's tempters, whether it be in the prosperity gospel today, the belief that if you, uh, if you believe hard enough, you can name it and claim it with whatever you want and it will come to you, or your prey to those Jehovah's Witnesses when they are coming knocking at your door and saying, it didn't say the word was God, but the word was a God. The cults are always coming. 
and the people that they attack are those who cannot read their Bible. Biblical literacy was what was missing in the early church when Mary began to be seen as a lifelong virgin who now intercedes on our behalf. Biblical literacy was nowhere to be found when Muhammad was spreading Islam in its days of infancy. Biblical literacy was absent when Jehovah's Witness used his visions to entrap a generation of Christians who didn't read, need to read their Bibles because they got it delivered to them at church each Sunday. And Jim Jones went as far as banning Bibles in the people's temple. I think in a way what's kind of funny is that for Grace Community Bible Church here, uh, becoming proficient in biblical literacy protects you first and foremost from me, since I'm the one delivering the Bible each week. And let's be honest, everything I've said from this pulpit has not always been right. I've said some wrong things here. I've been called out on things before, and I am thankful for that. Uh, no church should entirely depend on their pastor to deliver the word of God because pastors make mistakes. They can err in their theology. They can err in their interpretations of the Bible. Hopefully, I don't err all the time, uh, but I'm, I'm preaching on Romans 16 this Sunday, and it's the, that list of all those names and greetings that Paul gives at the end of Romans. You know, greeting to Phoebe, greeting to Aquilus and Priscilla, and on on all those names. And, and I think that my message, I believe it is, uh, biblically based and coming expositionally from the scripture. But on the other hand, when you're preaching a passage that is giving truth off of a list of greetings from names, sometimes you got to be like, am I reading too much into this? And so it is preferable, it is better, it is healthier to have an entire church who has a full knowledge and understanding of the word and can read it with understanding because there's times when every church's leader can and probably will be wrong. So why do we need to be biblically literate? We need to be biblically literate because Satan's most common tool to use against both the church and the unbeliever is a poor understanding of the Bible. The Bible is purposefully abused by Satan. It is purposefully abused by false teachers every single day, every single Sunday. And biblical literacy is about how you can handle God's word right so that you can be protected when Satan twists the scriptures and tempts you to go down the wrong path. So, the question, that's, so that's why we have biblical literacy. And so now the question is, what is biblical literacy? The first thing we should understand is that biblical literacy is a process and not a destination or a goal to achieve. So in one sense, uh, you can become biblically literate as soon as you begin to try to read and understand the Bible. And on another sense, no one will ever be fully biblically literate. No one will ever arrive. So that's the first thing that we need to note, that biblical literacy is both for the 10-year-old who is learning how to read through his Bible for the very first time, and it's also for the person who has been on a 60-year journey of reading through the Bible consistently every morning, who has read it through cover to cover uh, dozens of times and delved deeply into the text. And one of the interesting things about biblical, li biblical literacy is that sometimes that child, who is reading the scripture for the first time could be better at understanding the scripture than the person who has read it for 50 years because we have the tendency at times to bring in presuppositions we have, beliefs we have about what the scripture says instead of actually reading the word to say, what's the Bible saying that I should be understanding from the text? And so we have a temptation to bring our own predetermined meetings into the Bible instead of allowing the Bible to speak for itself. Um, so biblical literacy is the process of gaining proficiency and understanding the Bible through the reading of the Bible itself. So it's gaining proficiency and understanding the Word of God. And the key to, to biblical literacy is that it is not understanding the Word of God because we're reading theological books or understanding the Word of God because we're reading commentaries or books about Bible background. But biblical literacy is the idea of understanding the Bible because we're reading the Bible itself. One of the sections on the new book, The Postmodern Pilgrim's Progress, uh, which is a new version of The Pilgrim's Progress that was put out by the crazy comedy guys at the Babylon Bee. Uh, but at one point in this book, uh, Christian, uh, the new Christian in this series, goes and visits a city called Evangelion 
which is supposed to be modern day evangelicalism. And so they, they sort of hit on all the negatives of evangelicalism in the midst of this dome city that's protected from all the darkness outside. And one of the things about evangelicalism is that as Christian is walking through this, he has people coming up to him again and again, uh, showing, them, showing him Bible studies and commentaries and helpful tools on how to read the Bible and all of this stuff. And then Christian's like, do you, have, do you guys have any Bibles? And they're like, we can't find them amidst all of these books that we have about the Bible. Uh, so this is the idea of saying, we just don't want to read books about the Bible, but biblical literacy is about gaining our understanding of the Bible from the Bible itself. And this is important because as we've noted throughout church history, the most dangerous cults are those who have taken the Bible, twisted it out of context, uh, they, they've tweaked a line here, a sentence there. They apply a promise to you that was never meant to be written to you. They take the warnings of the Bible that should be given to these people and give them to those people and make the Bible say what it was never intended to say. Therefore, as helpful as background books are on the Bible, and we're going to talk about those especially in the later weeks, biblical literacy is about making sure we keep our eyes on the prize, and that is we are reading the Scripture itself. We are reading Genesis to Revelation, and we want to talk about how to use all those other books in a way to supplement, to amplify our Bible reading and not as a substitute for the Bible itself. So that's what biblical literacy is, is growing in proficiency of understanding the Bible by reading the Bible. The purpose of biblical literacy is to gain proficiency in understanding the Bible so that one may grow in an awareness of God. So we don't read the Bible for a historical knowledge of what took place 2,400 years ago or 2,000 years ago. We don't read the Bible for great religious insights or even for the development of good godly character. Now, reading the Bible does provide some awesome historical knowledge. Uh, I love reading all of those times where archaeology just lines up right perfect with the Scripture. It's, it's amazing. Uh, the Bible does um, allow us to have insight into uh, religious practice in the world and, and spiritual knowledge. Uh, the Bible does help us to grow in Christian character, but the Bible is not primarily a book of self-improvement, but the Bible is a book about awareness of God. The Bible was given so that we could know who God is, what God is like, what God has done, what God has promised, and what God will do. We read the Bible so we can understand God. If you really want to see the importance of biblical literacy, all you have to do is look at the Protestant Reformation itself. Martin Luther grew up as a youth and a young monk who saw God as demanding, harsh, and judgmental. Uh, Luther wrote about how he tried to stay as far away from God as possible, even when living a, a highly devoted life as a monk. And this was basically because that's how the Catholic Church functioned for hundreds of years. They set up barriers between man, the average laity, and the Bible, and between God and man. Uh, first, they had their clergy-laity division. Second, they had the division of Mary and saints taking prayers up to God. Uh, and they kept adding on all of these layers where the average person was terrified of the thought of God and looked for refuge from the saints and from Mary in order to protect them from God. And then all of a sudden, Luther started reading the Bible himself. And what did Luther discover when he read the Bible himself? The first thing he discovered, I mean, we look at the, the faith and works and the salvation stuff, but actually the first thing that Luther discovered was God's not a vengeful God. God is a loving father. God is not quick to wrath, but God is slow to anger. And so not talked about as much because it wasn't as significant as what related to the gospel, uh, but the, by reading the Bible changed the way Luther saw God. And interacting with the Bible, understanding the Bible, gave Luther a greater awareness that God is not a demanding, vengeful being, but God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. Uh, I sometimes I just love reading Luther's sermons because you could tell in Luther's actual sermons to his church that the overriding message 
message that he had to his congregation was trying to sort of reprogram the way they viewed God. And so many of his sermons were focused on, we see God this way, but Scripture presents God this way. You see God as the demanding God who wants to send you to purgatory. Well, what we find is that Jesus has taken all of our sins, he's covered it all, and wants to welcome us into his presence and his righteousness and his love, and God wants to hold you into his bosom. And so uh, that was a main part of Luther's preaching ministry. And so that's what we're looking for for biblical literacy. That's the point, is that we want to know God. And we want to know God not as he is shaped by our thoughts and imaginations, but we want to know God how he's revealed by his word. And if we want to understand who God is, if we want to understand how God was uh, brought spirit, one of the things that we need to understand is that in order to really know God, we need to know him from the entirety of his word. I don't think it is a random thing that the time period through which biblical history was written, uh, if you think of when Moses first started writing uh, the first five books of the Bible to when the canon was closed, uh, that was about 1,400 years of writing the Scripture. And I think that that should tell us that if we want to understand God, it can't be found in a single story, it can't be found in a single passage or page, but we're going to need all of those years of history, all of those stories, all of those laws, all of those songs, all of those letters, all of those prophecies in order to have the clearest view of who God is in this lifetime. So the Christian who only knows the New Testament or the letters of Paul doesn't know God as he should. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest problems with Andy Stanley, who has one of the probably 10 biggest churches in America, is that he's trying to start a movement where he says we need to unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament. We want to unhitch uh, God and how we understand him from what we see in the Old Testament. So he's trying to say, you know, we need to stop preaching from the New Testament and, and not emphasize things that happen in there. Just, just only look at the New Testament. Well, the problem is, is that that gives us an incomplete view of God. Uh, the most beautiful pictures of God's compassion are in the Old Testament. Uh, the most wonderful description of God, who he is, is in Exodus 34. And, and we miss all of that wonder of God's glory when we don't see the wholeness and the breadth of who he is. And so what biblical literacy does is it says, if we want to understand God, we need to know God from when he was the creator speaking creation into existence in the book of Genesis to where he is the rider on the white horse coming back to remake this earth in the book of Revelation. And we need everything in between in order to understand God. So biblical literacy should not be seen as an academic exercise, but it's a journey in growing into an understanding and awareness and an intimacy of God. And this is also why no one ever arrives. This is why it's always a process when it comes to biblical literacy. This is why some of the er some of the readings of the Bible in our earliest stages can be better than some of our readings of the Bible at the later stages because we want to be getting right into the text and what God has to say of himself. So our goal should always be to know God better and also to understand that the more we understand God's word, the more we learn about God himself. So when we see how God responds to Israel in the wilderness, when we see how God defended Jerusalem when they were surrounded by the Assyrians, when we see God's love for Israel through the life of the prophet Hosea, when we see God's love for the world through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, when we see the wisdom of Jesus in his interactions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in those few days leading up to his crucifixion, when we see the final plans of God through the prophecies of the coming last days, through all of those, that is how we are made aware of who our God is. Now, some of you may still be thinking, you know, I don't really need a series like this, though. Like, like, like I'm good. I can read my Bible, and I, I, can, I can understand this. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, well, one thing that uh, biblical literacy recognizes is that familiarity with the Bible can be a curse just as much as a blessing. I've hinted on this already. Uh, familiarity brings two dangers to Christians when it comes to reading our Bibles. Uh, the first danger is that I don't need to read my Bible. 
That's the first and biggest danger of familiarity with the Scripture. I don't need to read my Bible. I've already read it cover to cover. And I've read it so many times. I don't need to read it anymore. I still remember the emotions that I had and the thoughts I had the first time I read through my Bible from beginning to end. Uh, I did it uh, in my first year of college. It took about nine months, read through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, never done it before. And I remember reading through particularly Isaiah and Ezekiel for the first time and those two books thinking, I had no idea this was in the Bible. And, and what is this guy doing? Like, like this stuff's awesome and crazy. And, and there are times where I wish I could go back and have that experience again. You know, reading it for the very first time, that excitement of experiencing something I had never even considered being in the Bible before. And at this point, I couldn't tell you how many times I've read through the Bible from beginning to end, uh, especially if you consider not just reads through the Bible, but studying individual passages. And this familiarity with the Bible, it does bring about a temptation where it makes it easier to say, you know what, I don't need to read it today. And you know what happens if you don't read it today? What are you more likely to do tomorrow? Not read it again. And if you haven't read it today, if you haven't read it yesterday, what are you even more likely to do the next tomorrow? Not read it that day as well. And so it's real easy once you've read the Bible so many times to say, I don't read it today, and then it starts a new pattern. The other problem that familiarity with the Bible has is that uh, it allows us to put our own views into the text. We end up having these robust and passionate views of theological positions, and we believe that we can support that positions in passages where uh, it cannot be found in any place. Uh, earlier this year, I decided to go on an interesting journey, and I read the, what might be the first book ever written in the English language. Uh, it's an updated uh, version of it, but it is Pelagius's commentary on Romans. Uh, Pelagius is known as one of the more famous church heretics. Uh, I don't really believe he was a heretic after reading his commentary on Romans. Uh, I think he was sort of skewed into a box that he didn't belong in. Uh, but it was clear reading Pelagius' commentary on Romans that, one, this dude spent a lot of time in the Bible. He had studied it a lot. He knew it. Uh, he was passionate about it. Didn't agree with everything that he said, but this was a guy who studied the Bible. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, though, about Pelagius is that he was an ascetic. And ascetic would mean that Pelagius was one of those individuals who believed in things like extreme fasting in order to gain holiness. Or if you wanted to fight off temptation, you should go and live out in the wilderness all alone. And so you have a lot of you know, crazy ascetics during that time period, uh, like the, um, the, the pole sitters. I don't know if you've heard about the pole sitters in ancient church history. They would, they would live on top of uh, old Roman columns uh, as long as they could, and people would pass them up food, and they just live only on the those. Well, Pelagius was an ascetic, so he had those same types of belief. And in Romans chapter 15, uh, Paul writes on uh, differences that you can have in the church. And one of the differences that Paul touches on is those who eat meat being fighting with those who only eat vegetables. And the funny thing is, is that in that chapter, what Paul says is the strong Christian is the one who eat meat. The weak Christian is the one who eats only vegetables. Well, if you're an ascetic, you believe that eating meat is a form of weakness and that it is not a good thing to do, that you should, you should restrict yourself from doing that and only eat vegetables. And so, uh, so Pelagius, throughout all of Romans, for 14 chapters, one of the most common things he's doing is just writing basically, you know, like, like I agree with Paul, amen, Paul. You know, like, like he's every, every point down the line, agreeing with whatever Paul writes in Romans. And then he gets to this one point where Paul would hit right on ascetics, and Paul's like, he said the strong Christian is the one who eats meat, but we all know this was a way to really say the strong Christian is the one who only eats vegetables. And so he brought his own theological view into that text in order to support his asceticism. And sometimes we do the same thing when we read the Bible ourselves, is that we take views and understanding of God and Christian living, and we bring those into the Bible and into the text itself. And this is one of the reasons that um, biblical literacy is focused on reading the Bible itself. Because the more we're reading 
other theological books, the more we're reading other commentaries and works about the Bible, the easier it is for us to get manipulated by outside voices to allow those to change the way we're reading the text. Uh, Because one thing about Pelagius, excuse me, he was very popular in that time period. A shockingly large number of documents of some of his letters uh, survived to this very day. And uh, he was huge in the ascetic community. So how would it have continued from generation to generation when you had following generation of ascetics read Pelagius' writings? They would come to that section and say, oh, look, Pelagius says Paul really doesn't mean the strong Christian eat meat. Of course it's the weak one eating the meat and the strong one only eats vegetables. And when we're spending all of our time in books that other people are writing about their thoughts of the Bible and not the Bible itself, it allows us to fall into that danger of familiarity where we're bringing our own views and our own teachings into the text. When we want to keep our eyes on the prize, we want to stay upon the text of the Bible itself. Because the last thing we want to do is fashion a God based off of our own views of what is right and wrong, our own families, our own traditions, instead of how God presents himself in his word. And so this is all meant to teach uh, how you can read the Bible in order to know and understand God. So the purpose of our short little six-week series is to help us all advance just a little bit farther at the skill of reading the Bible. Uh, So this, this is not about studying the Bible. This is not about, you know, picking a passage of Scripture and how to get deep into studying it. But what this is about is you get up in the morning, and you, you, I don't know how long of a Bible passage any of you read in the morning or evening or whenever you'd read your Bible. And you read through a, a chapter of the Bible. Or maybe you're somebody who likes to read through the Bible every year. And so you read through your three chapters every morning. So this is about how to have understanding when you're, you're reading that chapter, those three chapters in the morning. So when you're just coming to the Bible itself and understanding what the Word of God says. So hopefully at the end of this six weeks, we will all be a little bit farther in the process of being biblically literate so that we can be Christians who will not be as easily swayed and deceived by God's adversary.